Praise God, good, good word. Yeah. How do we put out the fires at, of our home when we don't even know it's on fire? You know, I'm just, I was just thinking that when you said it. Um, okay, so in, um, you guys doing all right? You guys ready today? Hang on. I'm going to, I, I got to empty my pockets. So um, we've been in a series in January, the whole month, on asking, seeking, and knocking um, in Matthew chapter 7. And um, I, I think we've laid the foundation through this month. Um, we're going to do one more class today, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping this really ties things together. I I've, I've, have received calls on different questions, which is, you know, which we always love. You know, we love when people call and have a question about what they heard from the previous Sunday. So um, it's, it's very exciting, it's very exciting. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you haven't heard uh, them, they are, like Cindy said, they are up online. So let's, uh, let's get right into this. Um, turn um, in, uh, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. And, um, and we, we talked about this last week. So asking of God or calling upon God, um, praying is, is a, a form of asking and calling and even crying out to God. These all come into the same category uh, of what God um, has uh, told us that we can do. So with that, we went into Paul's prayer last week, if you guys remember, where Paul prayed three things um, to God. And, um, and it came, came about because Paul was given the mystery of the church and the mystery of the Gentile. And, and it, it, he explains it in, in verse 8 of Ephesians 3. It says, unto me, uh, b- by the way, before I go into that, let me show you what that mystery was. It's in Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. That became the mystery. That was something that was hid from all in all time up to this present time when Paul was given this. And then he said this in verse eight: "Unto me, who am least than the le- or less than all of the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable." Riches of Christ. And this word unsearchable is, is a very interesting word. And it basically means that Gentile people would not search for the things of God on their own. They would, they, they, it wasn't given to them. The prophets didn't come through them. Uh, God didn't speak through them. But now it's going to be like unveiled to them. That's what a mystery is, something that becomes unveiled, something that was hid and not understood, now made known beautifully and simply for the, for the Gentiles. And this word unsearchable um, in the Greek means to comprehend, that the Gentiles would not comprehend the things of God. They can't. It, it would have been impossible unless the gospel and then let and lets God opened up their understanding that they could comprehend it. So I do want to talk a little bit today about this understanding. What it, what does it mean to understand? Because when we know what it means to understand, then we can ask, then we can seek, then we can really knock. And um, in Proverbs, it, there's a, uh, probably every chapter talks about um, get wisdom and get understanding. 
get this understanding. Um, Incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Proverbs 2.2. This understand. How are we to understand things of God? How, How does that come? You know, it's not like learning in school where, oh, wow, now I understand algebra. You know, now I can get it. But this understanding is the things of God. It's, it's so deeper uh, for us to try to understand things that we, that we have, that, that is unsearchable to us prior to Jesus Christ. Um, Proverbs 2.11 says, keep understanding. And, and, and that is so, so amazing because it's like we are to guard it. The same way that we guard the truth and we guard the gospel is how we are to guard this understanding. Because it's, if you look at it, it's like, wow, it's like a gift. Nobody in their own mind or understanding can calculate and figure this out because it's spiritual. God has to allow it and and unveil the mystery or we don't get any of this. Uh, This is why grace is so amazing. And this is why, uh, you know, the teachings of Paul to the Gentiles were just incredible. He went to a people that were considered dogs that um, would not even receive the gospel if it was presented to them openly, and many still don't. Um, Turn in your Bibles to... um, So what Paul said is three things, if you remember his prayer from last week. Number one, this mystery, I pray that they get it. Remember that? That they would understand it. That was Paul's first prayer. Let them understand it. And even with us today, as we speak the word of God, I pray that you understand it. Because there's a lot of things that block that understanding. And um, so, number one, that they understand it. Number two, that they would experience it. So you might understand it, but you're not experiencing it. And, and, and it's just as, it, 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 you know, you can have a great understanding of things, but if we don't experience this truth if we don't experience what the holy spirit is putting upon our heart what is it it's just head knowledge and we don't want that a great experience to the things of god and then number three that that i would be able to speak it this what paul's saying that that i can really speak it so they understand it and that they get it or experience it Okay, so in Ephesians 4, now he is um, uh, dealing with some of the Gentiles. And in verse 17, he tells them to put on the new man and don't walk like the other Gentiles walk. Ephesians 4, 17. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Don't copy what everybody else is doing. God has chosen you and has called you out of the world not to act like the world no more, but you're in it to be able to give others understanding. So don't walk like the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And uh, that means in the emptiness of their thinking. Don't walk... If, if we're walking like everybody else, if we're doing like the world does, then there is emptiness. We, we don't have a full understanding. We don't have a full understanding. So look at this, verse 18. Because if you're, if you're going to walk in the emptiness of your thinking, this is the results. Having their understanding darkened. And, and let, let me, let's talk about this. So this... Understanding is the mind. It, it uh, our mind uh, is the facility to hold understanding. When you learn something, it, it happens in in your thinking. You've got to comprehend it, 
and discern it in your own mind, and then you say, true, not true. Those are, that's what you come, that's your conclusion. Um, but this is what our understanding is, and uh, understanding is very important in the Bible. Clear, precise, doctrine truth has a foundation in wisdom and in understanding. There must be that foundation of how we comprehend things. And the Bible teaches the Bible. And, um, and then the Holy Spirit enforces what we've been taught and makes it alive. So, so this, this understanding then becomes, look at that, it becomes darkened. The word darkened in the Greek is shat, shatizo. And it means deprived from light. That's the word. So darkened means I've been deprived from light. Not a natural light because we have the sun, the stars, the lights, but it's deprived from a spiritual, the spiritual light. Jesus Christ in, um, in John chapter 8 says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall what? Never walk in darkness. There's, there's, there's this separation from light and darkness in the spiritual world, just like there was a separation from light and darkness when God created uh, the world. So, um, so there's this darkness. The Bible says that Satan is the guide of this world and he has blinded the people's minds from understanding. In uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So Satan is working overtime to keep you from understanding. Why? Because truth sets us free. Truth delivers us and sets us free. So uh, shot, shot these though, Deprived from light. My understanding has been deprived from light. Deprived from the truth. And look at this. And being alienated from the life of God. Wow. This is what happens when we walk in the flesh. This is what happens when we walk in darkness. When we walk as the other Gentiles walk. In the emptiness of my understanding. I am then alienated, I am shut out, it's, it means in the Greek, shut out from a personal relationship, shut out from intimacy, shut out from fellowship of God, because I am walking um, um, with my understanding darkened, and now I'm alienated from God. Can't, see, can't receive understanding, can't receive truth. Because we're walking in the flesh. This is why the Bible says walk in the spirit. And you'll, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So they are alienated from the life of God. Do you know as we walk with God, he gives us life. We have eternal life. But there's, there's a walking that we are receiving from the Holy Spirit as we walk. And we're alienated from the life of God. And then it says, through the ignorance. God is calling it ignorance. When we walk separate from God, you're walking in, you're ignorant. You're ignorant in them because your heart has been blinded. There's no truth. You're just walking and doing your, and, it, and this is why it's empty. It's the vanity of, of, of their um, it's the vanity of their minds, the emptiness, the blindness of their heart. Okay? So, let me show you the other side of that. Because there's two types of understanding, spiritual-wise. One of them is in darkness, and the other one is in Ephesians 1.18. So, easy to remember, Ephesians 1.18, Ephesians 4.18. One is in darkness, and one of them is in um, light. Okay? Ephesians 1.18 The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. 
Now they're not darkened, now they're enlightened. So our understandings can be darkened or they can be lightened. That's it. It's one or the other. When it comes to spiritual insight. When it comes to receiving from God, either you're going to receive it in darkness or you're going to receive it in the light. So here, the eyes or your mind of your understanding has now been fully in, uh, been, the, the word being here, being enlightened means fully. You are fully enlightened with the, God, with the word of God. Uh, we don't have to walk in darkness of our thinking and our mind unless you're going to walk away from Christ. Um, as long as if you're not, if you're walking in your flesh, you're, you could, you're going to be darkened to spiritual truth. Um, so you're going to be enlightened that you may know. Isn't understanding about knowing? You know, when, when it says get understanding, God is saying, get to know me. Learn about me. So, that you may know what is the hope of your calling and what are the riches of your glory and the inheritance of the saints so we can know our we can we we can know what is the hope of our calling and we can know what are the riches we can have security and we can have assurance this is what understanding gives us assurance assurance and security i think these are two really important things for the Christian today, to have security. The world has no security at all. You have nothing you can bank on. You, can, you have nothing in this world you can depend on. And, and, and that includes uh, your social security check. I mean, because the way things are going there, that's getting shaky too. You know, so there's no guarantees to any of this stuff. But the Bible gives you a guarantee and a, and a full of surety of what God says all right so let's uh, let's get into this um, so asking right and we're gonna go into um, um, the Psalms and we're gonna bring a, a few of these out just like we've done the previous weeks and you know here's the thing you can study the song by the way does everybody have a Bible does anybody need a Bible? I mean, I will get you a Bible. It's very important that we open the Bible and we study and we're in it. Hey, the words are here. That's good. I want you moving pages or sliding phones or whatever you do. Um, but, um, but there are probably 40 or 50 of these stories where David is going to ask God. And, um, and you're going to see a pattern in how David asks um, or prays or calls upon God or cries out to God. The pattern is, is he is confident in his asking. Not, not um, arrogant, not arrogant, but asking in humility with knowing that God is going to answer. And, and this is a beautiful thing to think about. So let's start this. Um, turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 2. No, 4. 4. So this is going to be a little bit more of a study. Look, look at some of this. This is good. Uh, verse 1. So Psalms 4 verse 1. Everybody with me? Look at this. This is this this is good. So it says, "Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness." By the way, I think that term, "O God of my righteousness," this is the only place it's at, and it's amazing how David is thinking that you know. My righteous, I'm, I'm only righteous because of God. Righteousness is a gift. And, I, and he realizes that and he names God, says this about God. Now this is something that happened and David was delivered. And, and all of his examples, either he's praying and 
it, it, he's already been delivered or he is asking for deliverance or he is in a, a, a very serious problem right now and he's crying out, okay? So he says, hear me when I call, O God, my righteousness. And look at, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. So this word distress, because uh, I talk to a lot of people. We counsel a lot of people. There's a lot of distress in their lives. There's a lot of distress. And the word in the Hebrew means, this is so good, it means restricted. Distress restricts me. I am restricted from uh, living um, any type of victorious life in Christ. Distress restricts me. It distracts, it, 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 dis, um, it, it restricts the way I think. It, it restricts me in my prayer. It, it, it keeps me from going to God. It keeps me from asking and calling out to Him. This is all because of distress in my life. It's a restriction. And matter of fact, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a painful restriction. It can be very painful for us to live in that and not knowing how to get out. When I'm restricted, I'm enclosed. I, I have nowhere to move. Um, I can't get out. Uh, I'm restricted. My ability is restricted to live for God. I can't even call unto Him. I, I'm that restricted in life. Things happen within my life that the enemy restricts me, keeps me pushed down, keeps me isolated. I can't even call to God. It's hard to even breathe because I'm colla uh, things collapse in on me. When I'm restricted... Um, it's hard for me to understand. Even you can be here, you can be very distressed, and you won't even receive anything because you're restricted. Satan is restricting you. Okay? So it says here, um, enlarge, he enlarged me when I was in when I was when I was distressed, or he enlarged me when I was restricted painfully restricted the word means relieved god relieved me from my restriction only god can bring us out of areas of stress and distress and painful worry and and all this anxiety that comes upon my life only god can deliver us from that stuff because it's all mental, and I don't have an understanding of light, and I'm like I'm in darkness, and, and everybody seems distant, and I can't get out, and I can't get out. This is, this is the pain of distress in, in people's lives. Um, another thing with enlarge, um, just to think about this, is... Uh, the Bible says, you know, God can enlarge my heart even when I'm distressed, though. And, and that's a prayer that David does. Um, but he can enlarge. He can, for example, he can give me, he can give me joy in my distress. So, He's enlarged me now with joy. And I don't have to be I don't I don't have to be restricted in areas because it is a mental thing, but I can receive God's joy. And, and now I am enlarged, and it means if I become enlarged, it's bigger than the distress. It's bigger than the restriction. So I don't have to live in that garbage. Even though I'm in it, I can I can live in I can have joy because God has enlarged me. 
only the word of God, only promises in the word of God are able to enlarge me. Because the more, in, in, in a human form, people who are distressed, the more you try to think your way out of it or talk your way out of it, the worse it gets. And, 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 and you're, you're, you're trying to swim, but it's a whirlpool. You know, you're, you're just going in a circle. Uh, and, and people have lived like this. But I'm telling you, look what David does, right? Hear me when I call. And look at the last part of this. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Have, has any of you started off your prayer by saying, God, have mercy on me? I mean, usually we don't start that way. I mean, we just go into God, oh God, you know, but boy, have mercy on me. If there's anything within me, Lord God, just have mercy upon me. And, um, you know, he hears, he hears our prayers uh, not based upon how good you sound or how good your prayer sounds or how long it is. He answers your prayer based on mercy. He only hears us because he is a merciful God. That's amazing to think about that. What a thought that it's, it's because of his mercy. It's because of his mercy we can praise him. Right? Church, amen? You can praise him because God is a merciful God. Mercy is something you receive when you don't deserve it. You're deserving judgment. He gives you mercy. You are a Gentile. You weren't even supposed to come into this unless it was for the mystery of God. From the beginning, though, he planned you. He had you in mind. All right? Look at verse uh, 3. Uh, Psalm 4, verse 3, yep. Uh, but I know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call upon him. There's that confidence of David. You know, he didn't say, I hope he does. I hope he answers. No, no, when I call upon God, he's hearing me because you're his child. You're his child. We need to have an understanding of this. We need to believe it in our our thoughts. Look at verse four. This is good. Stand in awe and sin not. Wow. (laughs) Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart on your bed, and be still. Selah. The word selah means stop. Don't even read another verse. Because you don't have this verse yet. Stop and meditate and get this in your life. Now, what is this meaning here? This is good. Um, Stand in awe. Stand in awe. Um, the Hebrew word here is to tremble. Does standing in front of God make you tremble? It should. He's holy. He's a holy God and you're in his presence. What are you doing there? If you don't have Christ, you're not allowed. Only because of Christ we can stand in awe and, and, and we tremble before him. And if you're, listen, church, if you're in his presence and you're, you're just praising him and you're standing in awe, there will be no, there'll be no sin. In your, sin cannot be there. Christ has paid for it in full. This is the meaning. You are washed, and you, like Steve said, you are washed and you are cleansed because of the blood, and we can stand in awe of him. And we tremble before his name. Um, I think it was um, Tozier switches. He's, Most of us live by this. Um, sin and tremble not. They, they flip it, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but no, we, we are in his presence. And this is what David, this is why David could call upon him. He was in the presence of God. Commune with your own heart. And uh, God searches the heart. 
And, um, and, and this is commune means to have communion with, this is intimate fellowship because we're in the presence of God. We're standing in awe of him and his greatness and, and how merciful he is to me and, and how, how forgiving he is to us. And we stand in awe at that, that God has forgiven you. That, that, should, that should bring tears to your eyes. I mean, amazing what Christ did upon the cross in dying for our sins. And we stand in awe of that. And I commune in my own heart upon my own bed. And that means a place of rest. Because of the finished work, I can rest in what Jesus Christ has done. So I can commune and have fellowship with God in rest. In rest. And, and, get, and, and then guess what? When you're standing before God, you're still. There's no time to worry about all my distress, all my worry, all my fears, all my anxiety. They've got no place in the presence of God because God is there. Those things flee so I can stand in awe of Him. Sin is not a factor. My heart, I've been given a new heart. And I'm, in, uh, and I'm in the finished day rest upon my bed and I'm still and I know that He is God. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 86. Um, Charles Spurgeon. Let me get there. Um. You can do verse 1, 2. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, God will never cease to help us until we cease to need. God will never cease to help us until we cease to need. If there's no need, then the need from God's help would stop. But we are pretty needy people. There's always a need for Christ. He gave an example and said this, the manna fell every morning until they crossed into the Jordan. I had a need when I was in the wilderness. When I came into a land of flowing with milk and honey, there was no need for manna no more. I mean, it's amazing how God will answer your calls for your needs. And he supplies all all of your needs. Psalm 86. Bow down thy ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. So there's that need, and our needs can be very great at times. I mean, it's like, God, you know this need. I bring it to you. Um, this word poor, um, and this is really, this, this topic is more speaking of spiritual instead of a physical poor. Um, because we have spiritual needs too. And um, th this is where the whole Beatitudes came in Matthew 5, 3. Where Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is, theirs is the kingdom of God. And... Um, so this word, you know, blessed, as happy as that person who God gives a new spirit to. And um, it's, it's more of humility that he gives us his spirit. Um, but it says, look at this, bow down thy ear and hear me. Um, do you know God bows his ear down to you? But how low are you today? It doesn't matter how low, God's bowing his ear even that far. If we're right above the dust, he will bow down his ear that close. He inclines his ear to our call, to our needs. That's, that's beautiful. 
Verse 3, be merciful unto me, O God, for I cry unto thee daily. And there's that mercy again. It seems like David is, is praying and asking God, when you answer the prayer, remember that I need mercy. <laughs> you know, grant me mercy as I cry out to you. This word, uh, I cry out to thee daily, basically it just means all day. All day I cry out to you, God. All day I ask for mercy. All day you are inclining your ear unto me. Verse 5, for thou, Lord, art good. Look at this. And two things. God is good. And number one, he's ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive. I don't care what you did last night even. I don't care what you did this morning. It doesn't matter. God is still ready to forgive. This is a position that he's always ready. He's all, always ready to forgive you. He is a forgiving God. He is a forgiving God. Thank God for his forgiveness. And this is why we are to forgive one another as he has forgiven us. He's ready to forgive. And plenteous in mercy. Boy, David understood mercy. An abundance of mercy to all of them that call upon him. An abundance of, of mercy. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Wow, our prayers. Our prayers go up. We pray unto God. You know, there was, uh, you know, the, the story where Joshua, they sent Joshua out to fight the battle. And Moses said, I'm going to pray for this battle. And as long as Moses' hands were up, it says Israel prevailed. Soon as his hands went down, and I think of the song we sang today, right? With lifted hands, we lift our hands. Soon as his hands went down, the enemy prevailed. It's a picture of prayer. It's a picture of warfare. We need to pray for this city. We need to pray uh, for families to be very knitly close together, for our loved ones. We need to pray for uh, the addictions and, and the drugs that filter this area. We need to pray. Don't get heavy hands. Keep praying to God. Keep praying to God and let's get the victory over this stuff and this garbage. You know, the gospel needs to go forth. It, people need to get saved. The time is short. The days, the days are very short. So um, that was five. Um, six, give ears unto my prayer. Seven, in the day of my trouble, I will call unto thee, for thou will answer me. That, there's a, that, that, um, that area of confidence. You will answer God. You will answer. Many people, I think, do not call and cry on to God because they don't believe he'll answer. So we, we, we become silent. And silence is the worst because there's no communion. There's no fellowship with God. Call on to God. He wants to incline his ear. Let's, uh, let me give, let's go one more here. You guys good? You guys need to do some jumping jacks or get up or something? Um, Psalm 145, 145, one more. This is, um, I was, um, you know, looking for the verses on calling out asking, praying, um, and that, uh, that, that I would receive understanding, that our minds would be enlightened with truth. And, um, and, the, and then I seen this verse in the middle of this, which, um, which led me to something else. Look at 
verse 8, it says, Lord is gracious, he's compassionate, he's long-suffering, and he's great in mercy. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. Say that with me. God is what? Gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. Wow. Look what the Bible says about our God. But do you know him this way? Do you know him as being gracious, compassionate, slow to anger or judgment, that means, and great in mercy? Sometimes we know God after the wrath of God, but we don't know him this way. How do we learn to know him this way? How do we ask God if we don't know God after this? How do you call to God if you don't know he's gracious and he's very compassionate? How do we call out to him? How do we know it if we, if we don't learn it? If we don't have an understanding of who God is, how do we call out to him? Because this is the understanding of who God is. And you know, I, I might know him this way, but do you? Do you know the God of all grace? Do you know that God is so compassionate and tender-hearted with you? See, too many times we bring our past into who identifies us. Well, how could God be gracious and compassionate to this? But that this is dead. It's gone. You are a new creation. You have a new heart. You have a brand new mind of Christ that you can understand this compassion and this grace and this mercy. Do you know that God is merciful unto you? And every morning that mercy is brand new to you. But we are dissecting and putting our life under a microscope and and when we talk about communing on our own bed we're bringing up all the pain and the trouble that's all I can think about and that's what I commune with and we wonder why we live in distress and worry and fear and anxiety these are things of the world these are not things of God these are things from the old sin nature these are results from sin. They have nothing to do with the new creation. Stop living in them. They're not good. Look at yourself according to what God says about you. And then look at Him according to who He is. Gracious, full of compassion, slow to judgment, and great in mercy. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. Look at uh, verse, amen. Um, go ahead, clap. That's, I mean, that's to God, amen. Praise God. Verse 14. The Lord upholds all that fall. Uh-oh. Have you, have you fallen recently? Not physically. Fallen. You know what fallen is? It's when I give in to the old sin nature. You are fallen. You're living in the flesh. You're fallen. Because we don't need to. We, we have the fullness of life and we identify ourselves in the old. God upholds you when you fall. You know, this is, you know, a lot of times me and Keith, we, we preach corporately. But this here today is more personal and individual. Because you are loved. God loves you. You know, 
It doesn't even matter what your past was and what you did. You know, we're all in that same boat. God sums all your past up with one word, sinner. That's it. That, that's how you, but, but you're no longer that no more. You've got a new life. So he, and he raises up all those that are bowed down. Um, 16, thou opens thy hand and satisfies every desire of every living thing. When God answers your prayer, that's all he's doing is opening up his hands. And it's an, when, when he does that, it's an extension this way of how much he loves you or this way how much he loves you. Both of them are welcoming. One of them he did on the cross. And it was called love. Eighteen and nineteen. The Lord is near unto all of them that call upon him. Maybe sometimes we don't call upon him because we think he's so far away. He's so close to you. He's so close to you. To all of them that call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desires of them that fear him and, he, and, and also those he will hear their cry and he will save them or deliver them. But at the end of 18, he's near unto all of them that call him, to all that that call upon him in truth. Are you calling upon God in truth? Verse 8 is who God is. That's truth. In John 4, 24, Jesus told the woman at the well, those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. How do we get truth? By, by having understanding. Understanding gives us truth. Truth sets us free. Living in error keeps you in bondage, keeps you as a slave to sin. And God is saying, let me just set you free. And then I call upon him in that freedom. When I call upon God in grace, in compassion, slow to anger, and in great mercy, I'm calling to him in truth. It's who he is. Some of us only look at him as far as judgment goes. He will judge one day, but it will not be the believers. It will not be you because your judgment has already been paid in full for. Upon the cross, it said paid in full, stamped by Jesus Christ. So you will not pay for your sins, past, present, or future. That's an amazing thing to think about. Get understanding. Get wisdom. Go after God. Call upon Him. Believe in God. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed uh, this month of teaching um, on learning to call upon God. And you know what? When we look at God according to this way, the more you start to call upon God, like we said last week, the way you do it is going to change. In the beginning of your sal salvation, that's all you did is ask for yourself. As you grow in grace and learn who God is, gracious, compassionate, full of mercy, you start praying for others. You're asking for others, not as much for yourself. So, God bless you. We, we love you. Remember, mark your calendars for next week. Get with Chrissy. We're going to do a covered dish. And, um, and we're going to have a great time. Amen? God bless you. Thank you so much. Let me just pray real quick. Um, maybe you're here and you don't know if, if you were to die today that you would go to heaven. Remember, the, one of the key things... In Ephesians 1.18, it says that you may know the calling of God in your life. What is the will of God? Um, if you've never accepted Jesus, then 
you just ask him into your heart and you believe by faith. You come to him in faith and, um, and you ask him to save you because you're a sinner. And the Bible promises to do that. And this could be the first thing you've ever asked God to do. But, it's, but it has to be, it's the first and the foremost to call for salvation, to ask of him for salvation and he will give you eternal life. So, Lord Jesus, just come into my heart. Save me, I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. You died, was buried, and you rose again to give me life. That's it. That's all you do. If you've done that, um, talk to Pastor Keith or Steve or myself. Just let them know. I, I just want to pray over you and thank God for you. And then also, Lord, just bless the offering. Um, thank you, Father, that you provide. Thank you for those that give.